Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Bates. Uh, I'm the VP and Chief Architect for Emerging Storing Systems at Huawei. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about an NVMe computational storage array for high performance data analytics. So the outline of my talk today, uh, I'm gonna to start by talking about the anatomy of an NVMe computational storage array. I'm gonna look at the hardware and software that uh, makes up a CSA. And then one of the things I'd like to focus on today is looking at using the NVMe key value command set for computational storage and talking about how that interface is perhaps uh, more appropriate in certain scenarios uh, than some other of the storage interfaces that we, we tend to use. And then I'm gonna look at an example uh, in the area of high performance data analytics. So let's start by looking at the anatomy of a computational storage array. So if you look at the figure on the right here, um, we have uh, one example of the hardware that can represent and present uh, a, a computational storage array. One of the things I really love about computational storage arrays is uh, as long as you present a consistent uh, view uh, of an NVMe subsystem to the outside world, you can pretty much build a CSA out of any hardware you like. You can take advantage of, of technologies like CXL, GPUs, FPGAs, you know, pretty much anything you like. Uh, you can use hard disk drives or persistent memory if you have it, or NVMe SSDs, which support different command sets like ZNS or LBA. It really doesn't matter what hardware you use um, because you get to virtualize it and present a virtual view of that uh, to the outside world. And I, I think that's a really interesting uh, and fun space to work in. So in our example, we have a very classical NVMe over fabrics uh, kind of a set of hardware. We have high performance networking card, we have a CPU, we have some DRAM, and we have a bunch of NVMe solid state drives. Um, you know, some of the key properties of a computational storage array is, you know, we will expose a bunch of resources, uh, typically storage and, you know, soon to be compute uh, via NVMe over fabrics. And that could be over RDMA or TCP IP or fiber channel. Uh, we get to advertise a, a set of resources um, within the subsystem. Uh, we can take the hardware that we have and we can present you know, any kind of view of that. And one of the fun things about this is we can present a view of stuff that isn't even there. For example, I could, I could write some software that exposes uh, a subsystem that has exabytes of storage capacity. And as long as nobody tries to store too much data on my subsystem, I might get away with that. Uh, but, um, you know, typically uh, we're allowed to present a, a virtual or abstract view of the physical resources that are there. And on top of that, we can present a, a range of existing, emerging, and even vendor specific command sets and namespace types. So we get to present, you know, a whole range of different resources. And of course, multiple hosts can connect to our subsystem via uh, controllers um, so they can we can uh, expose this uh, system to a large number of, of compute nodes or hosts that can take advantage of the resources that reside on the computational storage array so a question that we get to ask is you know hmm what command sets and namespaces shall i advertise and remember you know in theory we don't even have to back those up with real resources i can i can advertise anything i like um no when the host try or, you know the host try to use it uh, it should really be there but uh, it's a fun mind experiment to see well what could i advertise and, and what would that mean so you know most of the nvme over fabric arrays today only expose lba based namespaces um, you know whether it's classical lba or zns you know i think this will definitely change in the future as new command sets emerge uh, and one interesting command set that I want to talk about today that we can expose over fabrics is the NVMe key value namespace, uh, namespace type or command set. Now, this is something that's already been standardized and the standard has been out for a while. Um, you know, people have discussed doing this at the drive level. Uh, that's not really what I want to look at today. I want to think a little bit more about, oh, what would happen if we exposed key value namespaces or namespaces that support the key value command set to the outside world when we're building our computational storage arrays. Now, other types of namespace or command sets that we might want to expose include classical LBA, ZNS, 
subsystem local memory uh, and computational programs. So for today's talk, we're going to consider four different command sets. Uh, I've got three in the slide. Sorry, that's a typo. We're going to expose the classical logical block address, LBA. We're going to expose key value. Uh, we're going to expose subsystem local memory and computational programs. Now, three of these command sets, three of these namespace types store data. Two of them store it persistently. That's LBA and KV. Uh, one of them stores data for processing. That's the subsystem local memory. And then we have computational program namespaces, which actually do some compute. And those are the four that we're going to consider for today's talk. Now, what we're going to do is take those um, namespaces uh, in a subsystem uh, and look at what that means uh, for computational storage. And particularly, we're going to look at the NVMe key value command set for computational storage. So, you know, in the diagram here on the right, uh, I've taken our computational storage array and I've connected it to a, a host that, that, that wants to do some form of compute. Uh, it has an application, which I'm showing here in red, in the small red box in the top CPU. And that application could be anything, could be a database, could be an AI framework, it could be something else. Uh, and it's actually talking uh, to files that reside on a local file system. So what it's done is it's taken that NVMe LBA namespace um, and it's put some kind of file system over the top. And this is very common. We do this a lot. And anyone who's spun up you know, AWS or Google uh, virtual machines in the public cloud have probably done something like this, where they, they you know, get an NVMe device and then they put namespace or, or file system over the top. Uh, that actually presents us with a bit of a challenge for computational storage. Because the application on the host is almost certainly wanting to compute on files, right? It might want to open a file. It might want to seek to a certain part of the file. And then it might want to do some kind of processing, either on the whole file or part of that file. But the problem is the computational storage array has no idea that that local file system exists, right? The, the local file system was created uh, on the compute node. Uh, in this case, it's XFS, but it could be something else. Um, and, and so we really don't have any sense of files or file names or file permissions or file accesses. Uh, we only understand LBAs. So, you know, often there's a host local file system that's between the application and the computational storage array. And trying to solve how we get that mapping between logical block addresses and parts of a file between the host and the, and the computational storage array is a bit of a challenge. If we look at that from a simple coding example, you know, we might have data in parquet format in a part, you know, in a file that's residing on this local file system. And then we might want to do an SQL query on this parquet data, which is maybe some kind of table. So, you know, I even did a simple example where I took a bunch of stock data, ticker data that's in a table format, including highs and lows and volumes traded. Uh, and it's a uh, and something we want to run an SQL query against. And the query I chose was to find the largest high value of the stock uh, and print the row from which it came, right? So very simple, um, but something that, you know, is meaningful. We may want to perform this kind of analytics. So as this, you know, this example, we want to read the parquet file off the NVMe over fabric namespace with the file system on top. Then if we wanted to offload this snippet of code, if we wanted to offload the SQL query to the computational storage array, we'd have to wonder how do we solve the problem that the computational storage array has no idea what this file data.parquet is or where it resides on the computational storage array. That, that's a problem. By moving to a KV interface, the mapping between the objects is consistent for both the app and the CSA. So, so let's look at that as an example. So now we, we do things slightly differently. Uh, now, instead of having a local file system, we, we might have something like a library. Uh, in this case, I called it libs3 uh, because s3 is a very common object store interface. And now our application, rather than talking to a file, it, it actually talks to an object, right? So it, it potentially um, gets the object and, and reads that object uh, and then performs the same query against that object. 
Uh, so the KV interface can be used either uh, via <coughs> a library or via some kind of client. Uh, and it's the same hash, the key is value is the same, or at least we're gonna assume the key value uh, is the same on both the uh, host and the target. And that, that might not be always true. There may be a layer of indirection or bucketization there, but we'll just leave that uh, for now. And, and we'll just assume uh, that the object uh, key is the same on both the host and the CSA. And now it becomes very simple for the SQL query to be moved off the CPU and onto the computational storage array using a series of NVMe commands. Uh, for example, we might use an NVMe copy command, a namespace copy command, to copy the object, um, the data.parquet object, which is the object associated with the key, uh, where the key is the hash of this uh, file name, to subsystem local memory. So we can actually take a copy of the parquet file, uh, which is now an object, and move that into subsystem local memory. We can then download our SQL query to a computational program uh, namespace. In this case, we're not you know, standardizing SQL queries yet. Uh, so this would be a vendor specific program or a vendor specific um, um, fixed function. Um, and then we would actually execute that SQL query against the parquet file, which is now in SLM namespace memory. Uh, the results can either be returned to the host or written back to the subsystem local memory or written out to one of the persistent namespaces, whether it's subsystem local memory or KV. But what we've actually managed to do now is quite simply take that query of that data.parquet and move it off the host and move it onto the computational storage array. So I'm going to talk a little about some of the benefits of that in my conclusion slide. Uh, in the very simple example I did, the data.parquet file, which contained this stock trading data in, in a table format, was about 55 megabytes in size. So if I compare the legacy approach of reading that parquet file um, you know, off the storage area network and onto my host node, um, I would have to move about 55 megabytes of data uh, in order to get that done. Uh, I would have to move the whole Parquet file over and then run my SQL query against it. Now, if I compare that to running the NVMe commands that I need to run to offload the computational storage, um, I did this you know, kind of on the back of a piece of paper. Uh, in the computational storage case, I think about 480 bytes needs to be transferred back and forth between the host node and the computational node in order to get uh, the same result. So I've reduced the amount of data that needs to be transferred from around 55 megabytes to about 480 bytes. Uh, that's about a 100,000 fold reduction in data movement requirements. Um, as you can imagine, that is very significant. That would very much alter the requirements of my storage networking. Uh, I might be able to get away with smaller networking cards. I'd certainly be able to dimension my storage area network a lot more simply, um, perhaps building it from cheaper components. So, you know, and then that would consume less power because I might need less, less switches and uh, less traffic on the network and so on and so forth. So there's definitely some benefits to the customer um, in this reduction in data movement. Now, another benefit um, for the customer and for, certainly for the compute node is that I've taken that SQL query uh, and all the CPU processing that goes with it, and I've moved it from the compute node to the computational storage array. Now, from a bigger view of the entire system, um, I haven't necessarily saved anything in terms of compute instructions because I'm still having to do the SQL query. But I am moving it off the compute node and moving it onto the storage system. Now, I, I um, ran that SQL query on a modern processor in our lab, and I used perf to measure the number of instructions. Uh, and I got for that particular, you know, 55 megabyte parquet file SQL query, find the max in a given column. Uh, that took about 7.8 million instructions, um, roughly. Uh, and those are 7.8 million instructions that I've managed using computational storage to move from the compute node 
to the computational storage array. Um, now for the customer, that's considerable benefit, right? Because now they don't need to run those 7.8 million instructions on their compute nodes. If you multiply that up by, you know, tens of thousands of queries per hour, um, you know, more, and spread that across multiple nodes that are all asking queries of data, um, we have the ability to massively offload the compute layer. Um, and that could be of significant benefit in, in certain scenarios. Now, there's also the potential that we can run those 7.8 million instructions more effectively on the computational storage array. Uh, in theory, we could even put in some kind of accelerator where we don't use a general purpose, you know, a, a central processing unit, a general purpose processor anymore, but perhaps we have some kind of SQL query engine. You know, for example, it's public domain that Intel's new uh, Sapphire Rapids processor has something a bit like that built into their um, some of their um, Xeons. So it's possible that you might get away with uh, a more efficient uh, system. And a question you might want to ask is, right, so set those 7.8 million instructions, if I run those on my customer's processor, how much energy do they consume, right? How much energy do those particular 7.8 million instructions consume from an energy consumption point of view? And is there a way I can do that with less energy um, on the computational storage array? Now, even if I can't do it with less, it's still potentially a benefit to the customer because they can get away with cheaper uh, simpler compute nodes, uh, and we put the complexity in the storage system. But it's also worth considering that it is also possible that we can build a shared accelerator resource in the computational storage uh, system uh, that can run those 7.8 million instructions or the equivalent work uh, for less amount of energy. And that's really the whole heterogeneous computing um, accelerator side of computational storage um, and not just moving compute from, you know, a CPU here to a CPU here, but actually performing some kind of offload. And then the final benefit to the customer is a latency reduction. Um, because we don't have to move this 55 megabytes of data from the storage uh, array to the compute node before we start processing, um, it's very likely we're going to get results in a shorter amount of real time, like real clock wall time. So we will be able to get the answer back to the customer um, in less time using a computational storage system than if we did it um, via the legacy method. So there's considerable benefits uh, to computational storage arrays in this particular case. And um, you know, with the key value command set, there's also this nice, um, perhaps more easy to consume um, factor that, that we want to consider. And I think, you know, we are certainly exploring this whole object store, uh, NVMe, KV, and uh, potentially other standards around object store kind of interface. Uh, as, as applications become object aware and, and as object uh, applications and object stores become more popular. So anyway, that's, that's kind of my, my talk for today. Um, Computational storage arrays, I think, are really exciting. Uh, we get to build them out of any hardware we like, and we can present this um, abstract view of those resources to uh, to hosts via the NVMe over Fabric subsystem paradigm. Uh, key value is, is pretty interesting, and I think there's a, a lot of very interesting work that can be done there. Uh, and then, obviously, the benefits of computational storage are, are really very compelling, uh, particularly on the, the data movement and then also potentially on energy savings uh, if we can um, get these 7.8 million instructions running more efficiently. Anyway, again, my name is Stephen Bates. Thank you very much for your time today uh, and take care.